morning, Scott. You are in the States. <laughs> it's a little early here, but uh, happy to be uh, virtually in Spain. It's, it's all okay. It's all of you. You can share your screen. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. So first off, I just want to say thank you so much for having me uh, at the conference this year. I wish I could be there in person. I definitely want to be back next year in person. Uh, this is one of my favorite events of the year, uh, getting a chance to come and present in Spain. Uh, and here today, I'm going to talk about some of the modern uh, app development you can do with .NET. There we go. Um, .NET 6 is, is probably one of my most exciting releases of .NET that I've been a part of. Um, we started uh, rebooting .NET back, back around 2014, shipping <laughs> .NET Core 1.0 uh, in 2016. Um, this, this version is the first version that unifies .NET back together again. Uh, we have the same base class libraries used across mobile, web, and desktop. Um, we are one of the fastest frameworks on the planet. Um, we made it easier to get started with the features we've added to C Sharp 10 and 9 uh, and F Sharp 6. We've got great support for all architectures, including ARM 64 on Apple. Um, and we are a, a long-term release. It's a three-year release. Um, kind of what I was just saying before, um, finally .NET is all back together again, where every workload, whether it's cloud, web, desktop, mobile, gaming, IoT, and AI all run on the exact same platform. Uh, the same compilers, the same languages, and the same uh, base class libraries. And so this is the first unified release that we've had. We, we really, the, the big change here is, is the mobile stuff. Xamarin uh, has been remade into .NET MAUI, and instead of running on, on uh, the, the tech it used to run on, it now is running on the same uh, base class library as the rest of .NET. Um, you know, we've been around for uh, 20 years. We just celebrated the 20 year anniversary of .NET in February, um, which is amazing. Uh, we have 5.6 million developers using .NET every day uh, in Visual Studio. We're growing at around 10% a year. Um, and so we're actually adding about a million a year to .NET, which I think is pretty good for a, a 20 year old framework. Uh, we've been the most loved framework for three, three years in a, in a row on the Stack Overflow uh, developer survey. I've not looked at the newest one. Um, and we're also one of the highest velocity OSS projects, even though we only open sourced in 2014. Before we shipped .NET 6, we were actually number one uh, on the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation's list. Uh, we fell down a little bit after that because uh, we shipped and slowed down a little bit. Um, with .NET 6, um, we've added more users in the first couple of months than we ever have. It's the fastest adopted version of .NET ever. Uh, with over 1.1 million people already moving from the older .NETs to .NET 6. And the most, in, most cool thing, though, is we have 21,000 community contributions from 6.9 thousand developers out there. Um, that's what is fueling .NET. Realize that more than half of the, of the, of the code in .NET that's being submitted is not from Microsoft. It's now from the open source community. So I'm really excited with the direction we're going. So big thank you to all the community. Um, and there might be somebody in the audience whose face is on this page. You know, we always, as we started rethinking .NET, performance has always been a key part of it. We want to make sure that uh, the reason you choose .NET is because your apps run faster than they run anywhere else. And you can see here we're 10 times faster than Node. But the big thing that happened in .NET 6 is we made our data performance go up considerably with, .NET, with Entity Framework Core being almost twice as fast as it was in .NET 5. Now you're getting that full ORM um, uh, with not, not any, any paying any performance penalty for that. Um, and of course, we can't ship a new .NET without shipping a new version of Visual Studio. So we also shipped Visual, Visual Studio 2022 um, last November. And for .NET developers, it brings a bunch of cool things, and some will show today. It, uh, it brings uh, some amazing GitHub and Azure integration um, where you can actually publish using GitHub Actions. 
It's got hot reload, my favorite feature in .NET 6. Um, it's built into to, to Visual Studio. Um, and then, of course, it's also uh, on a 64-bit uh, platform now. And so you can load even larger projects uh, into Visual Studio than you ever have been before. Even cooler is we just shipped, um, my, my link's bad. We just shipped this uh, a few weeks ago, a new version of Visual Studio 2022 for the Mac. And the cool thing about that is it's written entirely in .NET 6. It's the first Visual Studio to be written with uh, the newer framework. Um, and they did that to enable the M1 support. So it actually runs natively on a Mac. Um, and we also rewrote all the UI to use native Mac uh, uh, Cocoa libraries. So it actually runs like a native app. Um, and we have in preview now support for Maui as well. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this. We, ha if, you ha if you have older projects, if they're um, MVC, Web APIs, WinForms, WPF, we have a great tool that will help you port your application from the older .NET to .NET 6. And we think now's the time to do that. You know, .NET 6 has got all the right features and all the right stuff. It's, it's a great time to, to make that, that change forward. I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, we also have an open source version of WCF. That's a blocker for many of our customers. And so uh, there's, it, it, there's an open source version of WCF, and we plan to give commercial support for that later this year. And we're not going to put it in .NET, um, but there is a version out there for you. Um, now, some of the key pillars as we start, started thinking about .NET 6 was going to be simple, simpler development, focus on the cloud, and then really go shore up our, our native um, desktop and mobile applications. So a couple things here is um, unified SDK. So the first time ever you can do .NET new and build every single type of app application. We've got the mobile apps uh, in the .NET SDK. Uh, we've got hot reload, uh, both from Visual Studio and from the command line. Um, we've got our native support for ARM64, obviously, single exes, um, hot reload everywhere. Um, this is my favorite feature. You know, Typically, if you're building like a Blazor application, you, you make a change in your app, um, and you close the browser and you, you, you press F5, that's all gone now. Um, now we actually, you know, the, the negative of a, if you're a compiled technology like .NET or Java or C++, you typically run faster uh, than most non-compiled languages like JavaScript and Python, but you're slower in that inner loop, that developer cycle, because you've got to compile the code. With Hot Reload, you make a change and it updates immediately in the application. In fact, a Blazor application will actually reload the screen for you automatically. And it works in all of our apps, whether it's a WinForm, WPF, ASP.NET, um, works everywhere, even works in .NET Framework as well. So Hot Reload goes everywhere in .NET. This is my, my, my second favorite most feature, and the slide doesn't do it full justice. If you're a .NET developer for, forever, you've seen using, 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 using on the screen. Um, and so we now have a mechanism to have global usings. You can put a file in your application, list a couple of these global usings, and that means anything you list with the word global in front of it does not have to be in any other file. We have this built in uh, and turned on by default for our, our own applications like ASP.NET. An ASP.NET application will, will, will do all the usings for ASP.NET automatically. The next thing is we want your code just to, to pop more, not have all this space. And so notice that we have namespaces no longer require you to have a brace and indent. You can just do namespace semicolon, and uh, your code doesn't have to be indented at another level. We in introduced records in .NET um, 5, uh, but we've added support for structs as well. And so this is how you can define an entire class in a single line of code. Once again, giving less, less code to type. And, and the last one's the most important one. Um, if you look here, we, we can now infer um, lambdas automatically. It used to, you used to put a type like flunk string of int in front of this for the compiler to understand it. Now it automatically does this. And because of that, we can do this. This is the simplest ASP.NET application you can build now. Three lines of code and your code is fully running. And we did this because, you know, once again, we're trying to make .NET feel like it's modern. And so we're getting rid of some of this extra ceremony. You don't need to have a main anymore. Uh, you don't have to have a class anymore. You, the usings can go away with global usings. 
Um, and all the typecasting can go away with those with that with that feature I said before about lambdas. Um, and the idea here is if you're coming from Python or JavaScript, we want to make .NET look amazing. And that's what this is all about. Um, and you're going to continue to see us take this effort and move it forward. So let's talk about the cloud for a second. .NET is great for cloud, whether you're doing an in-scaled or in-tier application where you've got a front end, a back end, and a database. This is the traditional way .NET developers have built apps. Uh, but in this case, you might have to, uh, you, you can only scale your database so far. You can only scale your back end so far. And so .NET is also great at microservices, where you can see on the right side here, where I've got uh, a, a bunch of different components and I can scale horizontally. And I'm gonna show you uh, some of our distributed computing tech uh, that lets you really drive this in, the, in a second. And then of course, we run a lot of .NET at Microsoft. Um, the Azure Active Directory Gateway runs .NET. The App Service Gateway runs .NET. That means the, any, any calls going into either of these things are coming through .NET. Uh, Bing.com runs on .NET, and then the Dynamics 365 Gateway runs as well. And this is just a few of the, of the things that we actually run in dot, in, on .NET at Microsoft. We run a lot of stuff. Um, but we run this stuff at crazy scale. So uh, because some of, the, some of the services in Azure need to run on Windows machines or Linux machines, um, they cannot use Nginx, which is the, probably the best reverse proxy on the planet. Um, and so we, we ended up writing our own reverse proxy called YARP, yet another reverse proxy for our own company. Um, and the cool thing is it's a test bed for trying to make sure that we're making .NET faster and faster. And you can see um, 100 billion requests a month come through this thing just from Dynamics 365, 7.5 petabytes of data per month. Um, and that just shows you when you're using building your own apps on .NET, we're running them at scales that are unheard of. And uh, uh, it's why .NET is so fast. Um, the other thing is, you know, as we ship new versions of .NET, our goal is to make them available to, to all of our Azure customers right away, whether it's app service, static web apps, or functions. Last year with .NET 5, we got everything but functions. This year we got them all. Um, and uh, that's really exciting. It's not on the slide here, but we're also now, uh, gRPC is something that we, we, we put in .NET 3 and above, .NET 4.3 and above. And we're we're just now enabling support for Azure Azure uh, App Service to run uh, and support gRPC as well. So I'm really excited about that too. That's rolling out right now. Um, and then something that's really cool for me is um, Azure Container Apps. So the whole world is is in love with Kubernetes because it's vendor neutral, it's cloud neutral, um, and so people want to run their apps on containers on Kubernetes. Um, we have a new service that makes it even easier to do this. Instead of having to focus on running Kubernetes, we'll do it for you. So with Azure Container Apps, we your apps are running on Kubernetes, um, and we do all the magic. Um, it's very similar to App Service, except it's in containers on Kubernetes, um, and you don't have to focus on all the Kubernetes infrastructure. You just focus on your apps, um, and at any point you want, you can eject out. Uh, and we'll upgrade you right over to, to full Kubernetes if you want. But uh, we think it's a cool thing. It's built on a bunch of open source. Kubernetes, Kata is how we do scaling. Dapper is, is uh, for doing cloud native applications. And Envoy is, uh, is running some of our network stuff there. And of course, you know, we can't build a new service in Azure without having great support for it in all of our tools. So we have uh, container app support built into Visual Studio. And we have container app support built into Visual Studio Code as well. And so with that, um, I want to start off with a simple demo. And you know, we've had right-click publish in Visual Studio forever, and it gets used tens of thousands of times per month. But we want to start moving to a different, different phase. People always used to say, don't right-click and publish. Well, we have a new way of doing right-click and publish, where if you right-click, um, we can build a GitHub action for you automatically. This will automate your CI CD to publish you to the cloud. Uh, we're going to also support Azure DevOps too. Um, and we do a bunch of magic for you here. So when you, when you do this, we just put the same YAML file that you would get from GitHub into your application. But we also go out to the service that you're using, let's say app service, and we make sure that we grab the right um, publish key and stick that secret into GitHub for you. So we're automating some of the stuff you do manually if you didn't have our tools. And so, uh, we are going to do a quick demo and show you this. We've, at this point, we've already right-clicked 
and uh, enable this. And now we're going to make a change and publish it. And to do this, I'm going to use the podcast uh, uh, demo. The podcast demo app is an app we built for .NET Conf in November. And you can see on the screen here, we've got support for Android, iOS, desktop, um, web. It's It kind of shows you how to build a .NET app that does all the things using all the technologies. It's got microservices. It's got everything. You can grab uh, the code from here. And, and we make sure this, this demo is always, this podcast application is up to date with the latest version of .NET. So this will work on whatever version of .NET we've just shipped. Uh, and we keep it up to date. And it's one of my favorite 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 demos to do. Um, and so in this case, we are going to show CI CD with GitHub Actions. And I said we've right clicked already and we've um, we selected we want this. And what you're seeing on the screen here is Visual Studio built me this file and put all this stuff into it for me. And so I didn't have to write this. Uh, now I can just go make changes in my code and off to the cloud it will go. And so with that, just double check that audio is turned on. Is this is a YAML file that is generated automatically, and what it does is it allows provisioning of your resources to the environment on a commit, which is something you would want to do instead of right click and publish for a continuous integration and continuous deployment. You want that scenario. So let's take a look at what we can do with this. I've got the container app open in the portal, and I can go to the endpoint for the ingestion and notice I have these get methods, but I don't have a post method. That's because I haven't enabled ingestion yet. That's a, a flag that we have to configure. So instead of going through the whole process of publishing again, let's see how easy GitHub Actions make this. I'm gonna go back into my application and I'm going to open up my deployment file and go to the section with employment ingestion and we'll go ahead and change that to true and save that. So of course that gives us the opportunity to commit. So turn on feed ingestion and I'm gonna go ahead and commit all in sync. Now this has pushed this out. Let's see what's going on at GitHub. What we can see here is an action has been kicked off. This is our podcast API CI CD. So it's running all the various steps for that. It's going to log in, deploy ACR if it's not already there. So this is a non-destructive deployment. It'll build the updates, build the ingestion. And then there's also a deployment step that we can see here where it'll actually deploy the application. Let's give it a few moments and see where it takes us. Now we're deploying to production and our deployment was successful. So we have a full deployment. Let's go ahead and go back to our ingestion. And I'm gonna refresh this Swagger endpoint. Now notice that I have a post for the feeds. So just by making that small change and checking it in, we were able to automatically deploy and update our container app. Teams development, um, you right click, create a GitHub action or an Azure DevOps pipeline and make changes to your code. We build the app in the cloud, we publish it for you. The next thing I wanna talk about is something called Fusion Development. This is something we've been working on for a couple of years and some really cool features came out of it. Um, and this is, we've seen a rise of popularity in low code um, uh, development models, for things like Power Apps. And we want to make sure that .NET is the best way to build the back end of a Power App uh, or any, any kind of low code scenario. And so we've added great features to uh, .NET Web APIs uh, in .NET 5 uh, to enable it where you can take a token from a Power App. It'll flow down into the .NET application and the, and the .NET, .NET can make calls on behalf of the Power App user. We've added uh, Publish to API management. If you want to hook a pro dev API to uh, Power Apps, you have to do it with API management. And so we thought, hey, let's make it even easier. Um, not only can you right click and publish your app to the cloud, we can also take the swagger from your API, automatically put that into uh, API management. So your API is ready to be called. Uh, and this enables people to build apps with things like Power Apps. So we just shipped this um, 
uh, just a few weeks ago. This is a new feature in Visual Studio called Port Tunneling. Um, there's, a, there's a tech called Ingrok that you might have used in the past to do this. And this is, if I build an API on my local machine, how can I test it with a mobile device that's in my hand if, if uh, um, my mobile device isn't on my local network? Um, in this case, Power Apps, a Power App app is running in the cloud uh, somewhere and it's not on my local network. So how do I make that API available? So with this new port tunneling feature, you set two flags in your CS proj file, um, actually your build file and build settings. And what we'll do is we'll then make a public endpoint for you and the API can be called from the public internet. It's great for uh, debugging APIs in real time. And Brady Gaster is gonna jump in and show you this feature in person right here. So here I have my Power Apps environment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up this dev copy. This is the app I'm working on. And what you'll see when I go ahead and run it, is it's making a call out to an API. I've right click deployed this API out and uh, within Visual Studio, I've got the ability to include an APIM deployment. So I've ingested my API and APIM and so far it seems like things have been working, but I got a report that there's an error on it. So I wanna try to figure out what's wrong so this delete feature seems to be working, so that will actually delete it. Because now I've got six pending, whereas a minute ago I had seven. So now I want to go to a different one that I want to approve. And, oh, yep, looks like we got some kind of an error message. So I'm going to need to figure out what's going on here, see if it's just that issue or if it's all of them. I'll click this one. Yep, looks like I've got some sort of a bug in my API. So I'm going to need to actually debug the API um, with this Power App. Uh, which can be a little bit tricky. I'll bring over Visual Studio here. And here's my actual uh, feed endpoints uh, extensions, which is really all the different feed endpoints. And the one that I'm going to have to debug is this one, uh, this put, because that's where we're actually updating the user submitted feeds. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here and hit F5 and just kind of see if I can debug it. But it's probably a familiar problem whenever you've got to debug an API that's getting hit from an external you know, client is that whenever the you know you hit it you hit a five on it you're going to be debugging you know on localhost so it's kind of hard to actually hit it uh from you know something like a power app or something like that. so because it's on localhost it's not actually accessible from a power app so we have to fix this and in the cloud the good thing is we've enabled a new feature uh port tunneling in visual studio and i'll go ahead and create a couple of additional settings in my launch settings file here one is create tunnel, I'll set that to true. And the second one is to give it a tunnel name. And now when I hit F5, when I debug my API, uh, rather than debugging it on localhost, we're actually going to open up a public tunnel uh, back to my localhost machine and give myself a public DNS that I could actually drop in any kind of a cloud provider, any client, and hit it. So you can see there's my fully qualified. So now notice it's no longer running on um, localhost. It's running on .NET podcast podcast-5000.rel.tunnels.apis.visualstudio.com. So now this app is accessible on the public internet, and now we can actually debug that power app with this. Domain name, uh, that tunnel that I asked for, uh, sub tunnels.api.visualstudio.com. Now I'm using APIM, uh, API management, pardon me, in Azure to, uh, to uh, deal with my uh, uh, custom connectors and power apps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste this URL, which is now that tunnel back to myself into this API management instance. This is the actual API management instance that I just deployed to from Visual Studio, which we're using as a custom connector. And you can see when I hit the uh, get user submitted feeds, it's working uh, just to kind of make sure it's working. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here in that method and I'll go back over again and hit send. And yep, looks like we are uh, now directing traffic. So the breakpoint's been hit from the portal. So by, by calling the API directly from the Azure portal, you see the breakpoint hit, you can now debug in real time. From that APIM front door back to uh, my machine through the new feature of Visual Studio called port tunneling. So now what I'm gonna do <clears throat> is open up my Power Apps uh, uh, client here one more time. I'm gonna go back into that dev copy of the app that I'm working on. And now you'll see I've got six running right here. And then I want to go ahead and try and approve one of these with my breakpoint set inside of that uh, put method. And look, there you go. Uh, and I can see, oh, that's what's wrong. So I'm passing two parameters to that find method. It looks like I'm passing ID and cancellation token. Like maybe I copied and pasted those parameters and didn't think about it. 
I'm gonna go ahead and back that out, get rid of that cancellation token and just pass ID. And now I'm just gonna hit the debugger again. This is definitely gonna stop my power app from running, but that's okay, I'm the only one hitting it, it's my dev copy. So now what I'll do is I'll go back over to my power app again. Um, you know, this is my browser opening up that we're running in that tunnel. And since I'm running in the tunnel and the APIM is hitting my machine, I can hit this and we'll tunnel right back to my machine. You can see there's that ID that I just sent. I indeed found that feed and now it looks like things are working. So we're good to go. I was like it's going to remove that feed from that uh, context. So with that, you saw he was able to actually debug the Power App live uh, in the cloud, uh, fix his issue. The app now runs correctly. Port tunneling, great feature. Uh, we've been talking about building this for years and, and finally got it in. It'll come to Visual Studio Code next. Um, next, I want to talk about something we don't talk about a lot, which is distributed computing. So um, as we think about microservice applications, typically, unlike a, a interior application, a microservice application, you, you can scale each of the areas horizontally. Um, and so how do you do that in .NET? And so... Really, what I think about what I want to think about here is I've got some of my tech running, and um, I've got some state. Maybe I have a shopping cart. Maybe I have a user object, um, and I need to know that no matter if I if I take the number of machines and increase them from one to four, I need to make sure that that user profile can move between these. Now, what you would have done in the past is you might stick this data into a Redis cache. You might stick this data into a SQL database or a no uh, or or a, or a uh, non-relational database, but in this case, we have a, a technology in .NET called Orleans. It's been around for a long time. Um, in fact, this tech powers um, various features in Office. It powers uh, many of the features in Xbox Live, um, and what it does is lets you actually create an object. And it exists across all the different machines. It's it's a it's a distributed object. All you've got to do is take your object, add an interface to it, add a few lines of boilerplate code to your application, and now this object can let, can live across the processes. Um, it's cached in memory to be very very fast. But if it if you don't use it for a while, it gets stored into a into a storage like SQL database or an Azure storage account. Uh, so this is Orleans. It now ships with the same cycle as .NET, uh, and you're going to see in .NET 7 and .NET 8, we're going to more tightly integrate this with the actual core stack. Um, I kind of talked about all these points already. Um, and so with that, let's do a, a demo where Brady's going to take the podcast app and use Orleans to create chat rooms where I can listen to a podcast with others and, uh, and kind of chat with them as I'm doing that. So here you'll see the listen together part of the .NET Together podcast. What we're going to do is I want to go into one of my favorite shows. I'm going to click on the listen together uh, icon. I'm going to enter in my name and hit open room. And now what it's going to do is it's going to give me a room code. I'm going to copy that. Another user can take it and go to the together mode, paste in the code. But before we hit the join room button, what we're going to show. So in that case, he was using two clients to actually be in the podcast app at the same time, different names. Um, and he's going to show how we can share data between these things. So you is, we've added Orleans to this because it's really great for building these distributed apps and it's really great for doing like backends behind the uh, application where we want to control things uh, with state. Uh, so in this case, I want to control the state of a room. You'll see here that that grain uh, just fired off the join room method twice, uh, one for the user who created it, one for the second. You'll see as I scroll through the uh, track here, you'll see the update player state method's going to get updated as well. Go down here and I'll do the same thing. And there's an update player state method firing off because that grain is actually executing. All right, now I'll click leave room. See that leave room method's gonna fire. I'll go over here to discover and before I do, go back here to grains. I'm gonna go to a different show. This time I'm gonna go ahead and click join the room, enter in my name. And you'll see this time when I hit open room, now we're gonna have two grains because I've got two different rooms. So we created one room. You could actually see the methods fire on the object as you ran it. He created another room, and now we show in the dashboard we've got two rooms. So we're staring, sharing these objects across machines. When I leave the room, you'll see one goes away because there's nobody in the room. We don't need the grain anymore. And then I actually leave the room again, and there you go. 
That's a great example of how Orleans uh, grants can persist state in your app. Here's what that looks like. In my program CS, I wrote some custom uh, service wire up in middleware, uh, add Orleans and map Orleans dashboard, which we've added in the Orleans extensions uh, file here in the code. You'll see that all I'm going to do is I'm going to look and get my connection string um, uh, for uh, Azure storage. I'm going to give my Orleans cluster a name and a service name. I'm going to wire up storage as my backing store for the state and configure my endpoints. And then so he basically created his, his connection string. He added a backup store. So in case the object's not used for a while, it goes someplace to hang around. Um, and then his app is kind of- I'm going to turn on the optional dashboard just because I want to be able to see everything going on. Uh, that's the dashboard you saw right in here in the background. And that's going to answer at the WAC dashboard endpoint. And here's what my grain looks like. I inherit from grain and the iRoom grain interface. Big thing here is he just has a class and he, he, he all he has to do is derive it from grain. And once he does that, it becomes a distributed object that can exist across many machines. So you've got join room and leave room and set room and update player state. And those really just make calls to the domain objects in the back. We really already use them before. Like I said, I didn't have to change the hub code because we had these request handlers. And all I did was I went in and changed our calls uh, from instead of going directly to the EF uh, front of database. And now I'm actually making a call to get that grain from the grain factory and then calling the grain methods on that. What's cool is I've got this running in my uh, container environment. So you can see here I've got my listen together hub. I want to use VS to go ahead and attach to that process and uh, set, kind of set a breakpoint. And now what I can do is I can just attach to it and set my manage.net core for Unix as the uh, thing I want to attach to. And now when I actually run my code, I can step through it. And that gives me the opportunity to kind of see uh, what my code's going to look like when it's executing inside of that container or inside of a Kubernetes environment. I can actually kind of test it running directly inside the container environment and kind of get a better idea for what's going to happen in production. See, there's my uh, incoming username and my connection ID. So I can actually figure out what's going on. So what we've done is we've added Orleans to the uh, podcast sample because we think it's a great feature uh, for distributed dev and uh, one of the features of Orleans. And this is uh, the, the contrib dashboard. So we can kind of get a background view of what's going on in that Orleans cluster. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, hope this gives you some. So that's Orleans, which is something that, uh, as I said, it's been around in .NET for a long, long time. And, and we're going to make it more prominent because we think as, as people start building cloud native applications, you're going to need this distributed uh, object tech. So next um, is, you know, a long journey. We, we acquired Xamarin back in 2016. Um, Xamarin was the way of building iOS and Android apps on uh, .NET. And we introduced something we call .NET MAUI, which stands for .NET Multi-Platform App UI. Um, and many people ask, you know, well, is this going to be Silverlight or whatnot? .NET MAUI doesn't actually, um, it's not a UI platform it wraps all the existing platforms. And so if you're running on Windows, we use WinUI. If we're running on Mac, we use something called Mac Catalyst. If you're running on iOS, we actually use the, the native iOS uh, tech. And on Android, we're running the native Android tech. And so if you ever used Xamarin before, this tech's very different. Um, it's got a single project system. Xamarin used to have a project per uh, app type. So now you have one code base and you can build for four platforms. Um, we just shipped uh, the framework uh, at the build conference in May, uh, and the tools are still kind of in, in preview. They'll GA uh, or be generally available in, 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 in production in November. But the framework is actually production ready now. It's fully supported by us. You can build on it today. Um, super excited about it. Um, we also built a library called Maui Essentials. And if you look at the screen, Many of these things are, are things that every platform does differently. Um, you don't have to worry about that. If you want to go get the battery status, um, it's a different call on Windows than, as it would be on Android, as it would be on iOS or Mac. But you just call, create, call the battery object, and it will map to the right tech based on the platform you're on. So excited about this as well. Um, and with that, uh, James is going to do us a quick demo and show us um, some of the features of MAUI. Uh, primarily the new project system and the fact that all your configuration goes into a single place, uh, unlike uh, a Xamarin app would. Um, and then something else we've also shipped, we now have a, uh, the Android subsystem for Windows, which lets you run Android natively on Windows. And so it's the best way to, to build a, um, a, a MAUI app 
for cross-platform. You don't have to use emulators. You can run native Android on Windows uh, on the latest Windows 11. So that, let's show this. Let me introduce you to the .NET Podcast application written 100% natively with .NET MAUI across iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. Here I have the application running on Windows and Android, and it leverages common services all built with .NET, including web APIs, Azure databases, and SignalR that are also shared with the ASP.NET Core and Blazor web apps. Now the applications are running here natively on each platform. I can use my mouse and scroll wheel or touch controls over here. I can navigate into a show. I can go ahead and subscribe to it. If I wanna unsubscribe, we get native prompts on each platform. I can also go into the subscriptions and unsubscribe there too. What's great is that I can also come in and start listening to a podcast. Let me go ahead and pause it here for a second. And what's really neat about this application is that this has a new listen together mode. Now what's great is that this enables both iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, and the web version to create rooms that can be shared and listen to podcasts together. So let me go ahead and type in my name, James, and open the room. And now what I can do is take this code and put it over into my Android application. I'll join the room. I'll say Android over here and join the room. Instantaneously, you can see that Android has joined James, and now we can start listening to the podcast together on each platform, including skipping through and also sending emojis across based on how we think the podcast is going. Now, this is really cool because it shares nearly 100% of code, but still offers native playback on iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. Let's take a look at the application and how it was built. Over here, I have the podcast application solution with one single project with our entire source code in it, including all of our converters, models, pages written with XAML, platform helpers, view models, and shared views. All of my code is in this single project, which makes it an absolute delight to debug and code against. What's great here is that the CS proj has common functionality for all my applications, including application title, the identifier, version information, and additionally, the minimum and maximum supported information here. We can also see that .NET MAUI has very powerful features, including cross-platform images, splash screens, and icons. So here from the source code, we can go ahead and configure our icon, our splash screen, and automatically, if we dive into the resource folders and images, you can see we have a healthy blend of SVGs and PNGs. When you start up the application and compile it, .NET MAUI will automatically compile and optimize those SVGs and PNGs for you automatically. You can also put raw assets as well as other things, such as ResX files and your XAML styling in there. Now, it's really nice that you can also take advantage of the vast ecosystem of NuGets. Here, we're using Monkey Cache and MVVM helpers to be a little bit more productive when developing this application. Now, what I love is that there's a common startup in the application registering not only Don and Maui, but also Blazor, which I'll talk about here in a second, essential APIs to access native features, services, pages, and so much more. It even enables me to configure my cross-platform fonts that are handled automatically with .NET MAUI. Now, one thing I want to show you is that this is the XAML that you know and love coming from Xamarin Forms, WPF, or UWP with common data. Is it still working? Is it working or not? Hello? ¿Qué pasó? Sí, vale. Uh, mientras lo volvemos a, a poner, perdón el retraso, una cosa que me olvidé comentar, eh, que es interesante. Eh, 
Al final del evento tenéis un cajut. Si os podéis quedar, quedaros, porque tenéis eh, consolas Xbox, Nintendo Switch, hay un montón de regalos, son solo 10 preguntas, intentar eh, ganar y tenéis un, un montón de regalos. Voy a intentar ver si se puede ya ver la pantalla. Uh, just a second. Ok. Lo siento. Let me introduce you to the .NET Podcast app. This enables both iOS and skipping through and also sending emojis across based on how we think the podcast is going. Our entire source code in it, including all of our converters, models, pages written with XAML, platform helpers, view models, and shared views. All of my code is in this single project, which makes it an absolute delight to debug and code against. What's great here is that the CS proj has common functionality for all my applications, including application title, the identifier, version information, and additionally, the minimum and maximum supported information here. We can also see that Don Maui has very powerful features, including cross-platform images, splash screens, and icons. So here from the source code, we can go ahead and configure our icon, our splash screen, and automatically, if we dive into the resource folders and images, you can see we have a healthy blend of SVGs and PNGs. When you start up the application and compile it, .NET MAUI will automatically compile and optimize those SVGs and PNGs for you automatically. You can also put raw assets as well as other things, such as ResX files and your XAML styling in there. Now, it's really nice that you can also take advantage of the vast ecosystem of NuGets. Here, we're using Monkey Cache and MVVM helpers to be a little bit more productive when developing this application. Now, what I love is that there's a common startup in the application registering not only Don and Maui, but also Blazor, which I'll talk about here in a second, essential APIs to access native features, services, pages, and so much more. It even enables me to configure my cross-platform fonts that are handled automatically with .NET MAUI. Now, one thing I want to show you is that this is the XAML that you know and love coming from Xamarin Forms, WPF, or UWP with common data bindings as well. So if we go into the Discover page, which is the main page, we have some commonalities with Xamarin Forms, but additionally, some really new powerful features. So we have brand new .NET MAUI namespaces, and we have some things that we know and love, such as a powerful collection view, item templates, group headers. And here is this player control. Now, this is a composable control that's used on multiple pages of the application. Now, what's neat about the player control is that it actually taps into native capabilities. If I go into the platform folders, we'll see under Windows, iOS, and Android that each of them have audio services. Here, this is where you can go ahead and access native functionality. Here we can toggle into iOS. So we can see here's our iOS functionality. If I go into my services for Android and look at my media player services here, we can see that I have all of my Android namespaces available to me. You still get the power of the underlying platform, but with all of the great capabilities of building native cross-platform applications from a single code base. And additionally, with .NET MAUI, you can create hybrid applications. I said that this application shared common backend services with the Blazor application, but it also shares some UI components. If we open up the pages and the listen together page, we can see that this is actually using a Blazor web view. In fact, if we take a look up top, it's reusing all of the listen together capabilities that are shared directly in the Blazor application. This enables us to be So this is an important thing is we've actually put Blazor into Maui. So you can build native applications on Android, iOS, Windows, and Mac that actually use web tech. So um, we had a big customer that, that built an app this way on purpose where their web app needed to have access to cache registers and to screens. And so by making it a native app, uh, a native web app, like Electron style, 
they were able to, to call the native capabilities required to talk to the cash register uh, and the screens in the, in the building. Hyperproductive using Visual Studio, IntelliSense, Hot Reload, and so much more to target all of our different platforms. And that's .NET MAUI, enabling you to build beautiful native cross-platform apps across iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. And so, you know, what about web developers? Of course, you know, the cool part about our tech is we have tech all the way from full power on the far right here with MAUI, WinForms, WPF, that's full native. We've got great web support with ASP.NET Web API, MVC, Razor Pages, uh, but Blazor is great if you want to build a, a PWA. Um, now, what as I just mentioned before, as I paused the video, is you can merge the two things together and take Blazor and Maui together and build hybrid applications that use a bunch of web tech, but still can call native AP APIs on Windows, Mac, iOS, or Android. Um, you know, VS Code is an example of an Electron application where it's actually a, a native shell with a, a browser control inside of it. And we want to make sure you can do the same things uh, with .NET. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, you know, we have two two flavors of Blazor. We have Blazor Server, uh, my 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 favorite version actually because you have access to full .NET, um, and it's very lightweight. There's not there's not much weight there. But we also have uh, WebAssembly, um, which does have a little bit larger download size and maybe sometimes slower performance. But it fully runs in the browser, does not require anything, uh, and can, can can be completely offline. You can build real native apps with Blazor WebAssembly. And uh, but but to me, this is the magic here: is you know Blazor plus native app uh, with Maui uh, lets you build the coolest apps ever. App could be all web, uh, but still have access to the full file system and things like that uh, on a, on a device that it runs on. So uh, I have a quick demo of, of uh, some Blazor hybrid. So with one set of components, we can do desktop, we can do mobile, and we've got web as well. Web, desktop, and mobile, one set of UI components. Now, what's really cool is because these are actual native client apps, we can light up native functionality. You may have noticed that on the Windows app, We've got this extra little widget down here where we can see how much storage space we have on our device. And there's this convenient uh, make more space button so we can free up some space. If we uh, bring up the file explorer, we can see that, yeah. Um, let's see, where's my, my, uh, yeah, my PC? See, yeah, that is pretty much how much space I've got on my computer. It's not, not very much. Um, so we might wanna free some of that up. Uh, before we do that, let's look and see how that's all implemented. If we go into the MAUI project and let's go into MAUI program.cs, we can see that if we're on Windows, then we are adding an iStorage service so that we can get the how much storage space there is and clean it up if we need to. Here's the storage service implementation, and uh, it's using the normal .NET API system system.io APIs to get how much space is on my drive. And then the make more space button, that's actually using Windows native interop in order to call into the Windows platform. Let's see what it's doing. Uh, that is uh, going to apparently format my hard drive if you press that button. So let's go and give that a try. That sounds like fun. So let's bring back up the Windows desktop app. We'll click the make more space button. And unfortunately, Windows will not let you delete it. So we're protected there, but we can at least see that we're lighting up native functionality in our .NET MAUI Blazor application. So we've got mobile, desktop, web with native uh, uh, capabilities lit up for the platforms that we're running on. That's the beauty of Blazor Hybrid. As Dan said, that, that is, uh, that's the cool part about building able to web apps. They can run in native shells have access to native APIs. Obviously, formatting your drive is a terrible idea. I uh, don't recommend such things at all, but uh, that, that's kind of fun. So um, .NET 7, um, we just shipped, I think, Preview 5 uh, a week or so ago. And I thought I would show a, a couple of areas of .NET 7 in the remaining time that I have time to, to show. So I'm going to skip around a little bit uh, and maybe show some, something that uh, you've hope, hopefully you've never seen before. Uh, so first off, we are we are going to build a new mechanism for 
migrating older AFP.NET uh, web, web forms applications. Uh, there's a new feature where you can actually build a .NET Core app or an ASP.NET Core app that sits in front of your existing web forms application. And so the way it works is you can actually move your project page by page. As you uh, create a page in the ASP.NET Core application, all the requests go there first. If it can't find a page there, it then sends it to the old site. Um, and we have a mechanism so we can actually keep session state alive between those two things. Um, and so yep, here's session state. Uh, we only got a few types in there right now, uh, bytes and strings and ints, but we plan to add more. Um, and this is tech that's going to make it easier to migrate an application from .NET Framework to um, ASP.NET Core. Um, this is something that, that uh, you know, I mentioned before about uh, being able to have the uh, port tunneling. This is another feature that I'm really excited about. Um, and the idea is, you know, I kind of mentioned before, Kubernetes is everywhere. Cloud native container seems to be the way that you deploy the cloud these days. Well, it can be a pain to deploy to the cloud. If you're on a Windows machine, you need to have um, Hyper-V installed. You have to have Docker for desktop installed. Uh, it's a bunch of work. We want to make the .NET SDK be able to build containers directly without requiring all those other, other things, which means as a developer, you build your ASP.NET application. You don't even have to have a Docker file. And if you need to publish it to something like the container registry or Azure container apps, we'll just automatically make, make your code into a container and do the publish for you. And so uh, Tim's going to do a quick demo of a, of a preview that we've been working on uh, to do exactly this. This is a demonstration of a proof of concept to help you get to Azure container related services and registries as fast and friction free as possible using Visual Studio. First, let me show you the current state today. I have a ASP.NET uh, web API here, and I want to get it to Azure Container Apps, Azure Container Registry, or App Service with containers. In Visual Studio, you would do that uh, using Publish. And so I'm going ahead and go ahead and say, I want to go to get to Azure, choose I want to get this to my container registry. We have great Azure tooling to allow you to uh, create uh, Azure resources and provision new ones. I happen to have an existing one here, which I'm going to go ahead and select. Awesome. Visual Studio has helped me configure that. Everything looks good. I'm going to click Publish. And looks like I cannot actually get to uh, Azure Container Registry because it's asking me that you need Docker. That's right. I've heard of this Docker thing. I've been told I need to add it to my uh, application. So great. Visual Studio says, hey, great, awesome. Add Docker support. Uh, sure, I want Linux. Awesome. I have this now, new file. So this is, you know, just to be able to publish a container, Tim had to go convert. He had to right click on his project and add Docker support. I don't want to do that. I just want to publish my app to the cloud. I don't need, I don't want to do this. So um, he'll, he'll, he'll continue. That maybe I'm not familiar with as a concept, as a developer, because I don't usually work in containers. I'm just trying to get my app to containers. Uh, but that's fine. Everything looks good. I'm now going to click publish. Still can't do it. And the real reason is, is because uh, it's telling me exactly here. You need this thing called Docker Desktop. And when I go to that URL, it's going to take me here and saying, you need this, all these tools. Uh, I need this thing. How do I download it? It's going to ask me to reboot a couple times. Uh, not a great process. So fast forward, let me go ahead and delete this. And let me show you what we're trying to do to make that process as smooth as possible. And that process actually added a couple artifacts to our concept. So let me go ahead and clean those up and remove those profiles and show you that we don't need any of these in order to get to Azure Container Services. So I'm going to go through. So I love this. He removed all of the Docker stuff. He removed the Docker file. He removed all the settings. We stick it in your launch settings. Um, and now he's going to be able to publish a container without having to have any of that tech. For the same process again and make one change and show you how simple uh, it's going to be, uh, hopefully, in the future. Uh, please keep in mind this is a proof of concept, so there are some rough edges. Um, but let's go ahead and do that flow again. So again, I want Azure. I want Azure Container registry and I want to select my existing registry. So I'll click finish. Same aspect here. Now, uh, just as an implementation detail, we hope that you would not have to do this or we'll make an option for it. But now I want to say I want to use implicit container uh, support and I'm going to just set that to true. And again, we will smooth this over in the tooling experience, but inevitably that's the option that I'm going to choose. 
If you remember, I clicked publish before and I had a couple warnings and I had to do it a couple extra steps just to get my container as fast as possible to Azure. Now I'm just going to click publish and you can see we're already processing. Uh, so we've eliminated a, a couple steps, making it as fast as possible to get there. And the .NET SDK now is taking the responsibility of pushing this. And very quickly, I got my app to Azure Container Registry, which now I can use in an Azure Container app or app service uh, extremely quickly. We can go to the registry here, and you can see that I had nothing there before. Let's click Refresh, and here's the latest that we just pushed um, right here um, with all the information and all the different layering that goes along within containers. So we hopefully removing some steps for you to understand. Now, because this is a part of the .NET SDK, um, you would be able to also do this from uh, the CLI. Now I'm using the publish profile capability in .NET Publish in this proof of concept to be able to just say, hey, .NET Publish and use all this information, which is all contains all the same information that we have in this publish profile, defining the Azure registry I want to get to and some authentication type information. Uh, now I can also use this in my CI builds. And so having a great Visual Studio experience, but also a, a SDK level CLI experience to help you do the same thing as quickly as possible um, using your, C your CLI and in your CI tools without additional uh, SDKs or tools. And you can see I've gone and done that uh, very quickly. And if we go back and refresh, uh, we can see the latest here, and we can see that's the, the latest update was just uh, one minute later there. So thanks for watching the video. So that shows how we can build containers in .NET without requiring Hyper-V, without requiring WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and without requiring Docker or Docker files. I think it's the kind of future for where we're, where we're heading in the cloud. Um, I also want to talk about this. this. This just shipped in the preview five of .NET 7. And one of the areas that we, you know, once again, as you kind of saw earlier, how easy it was to build an ASP.NET uh, web application. We're continually going back through .NET and saying, wow, that's too complicated. That's too many steps. How do we simplify that? Um, and so we want to make it very easy to have easy development time, uh, uh, JWT token uh, authentication and authorization. And so this is what something would look like in .NET 6 today. And this is a lot of work. If you just want to protect an API and say, I only want Scott Hunter to be able to call the API. This is a lot of goop, and you might get it wrong. And so this is what it's going to look like in uh, Preview 5 of .NET 7. Uh, notice we went from this to this. This goes right down to what I really want. It's like uh, I do a authentication.add JWT bearer, uh, and then on my APIs, um, I have one that's not protected. I have one that's protected. And I just do a require authorization, and I give it the claim that I want for that access. And so you're going to continue to see us go through .NET and think, find things that are hard and make them easier. This is available in preview today uh, with the latest preview of .NET 7. Um, now there's some stuff that's really kind of out there. And uh, you know, we're always thinking as a team, what's coming next? And I've got two of these. I'm going to skip one. I'll, I'll talk to it first, and then I'll, I'll uh, and I'll do a demo of the second one. Um, actually, I, I must have taken it out of the out of the slides. Um, so WebAssembly, uh, that's the feature we have in Blazor that lets you run a .NET application directly in the browser. Um, WebAssembly might extend beyond just that kind of code. I'll give you an example. If you if you want to program in like YARP, you know, yet another reverse proxy, our, our proxy. Well, because we wrote the the the, uh, the reverse proxy in .NET, you of course write the rules in .NET. What if you could write the rules in any language? If 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 the if the proxy supported Wasm, then you could write the rules in C++ or Python or Go or Rust or .NET or Java. Um, and so WebAssembly is really cool because it lets you use any language. Um, and so in this case. We're we're trying something crazy here, which is letting you actually run uh, your .NET applications, any .NET application, via WebAssembly. So I can create a console application that would run the web. Um, I can create an ASP.NET application that could run on the edge. Um, and the nice thing about it is when I build that application, 
I don't have to know if it's ARM64 or X64 or X86 or friggin' mainframe or whatever. Um, WASM is kind of like the IL that makes up .NET. It's agnostic to those things. And so this is a cool demo we put together showing uh, building um, any .NET application on uh, WebAssembly. And that uh, WASI stands for WebAssembly on the server. So. Let's look at an exciting new experiment for .NET. This is a .NET project. It's a console application. You can see .NET 7. And the program itself, very straightforward. It gives the current time and tells you which OS architecture it's running on. Let's go ahead and run this. And as expected, what we get is the time and that we're running on OS architecture x64. Now let's make a simple change. I'm going to go into NuGet Package Manager and I've got this custom feed that has an SDK for WASM. We'll go ahead and install that. And now we're going to run the same program again with no change. And what you see is I'm running on OS architecture WASM. If we look at our files, I'm going to... So just adding a package converted the app from being a native .NET app to a .NET application that runs on WASM, which means it can run anywhere, any architecture. Um, to open in File Explorer, you can see if we go into bin debug, .NET 7, we actually have this hello world on wazi.wasm. Now this is a completely standalone file. In fact, there's a web-based version of WebAssembly, webassembly.sh, that I can upload this file to. So right now, this is just a, a website you can go to and, and upload any WASM files and run them. It has a list of built-in commands. We're going to do upload and we'll navigate to our demo and we'll grab that WASM file and now you can see there's that new command and it runs I'm running on OS architecture WASM if that's not exciting enough this is not just for trivial situations so he took the application, ran it in the browser, which is pretty pretty friggin' cool. Just a regular console app. Now we're gonna do the same thing with an ASP.NET application. It's because what I have here that I'm gonna set as a startup project is a WASI version of ASP.NET Core running completely on WASI. Let's go ahead and run that. As you can see, the WASM trace logger has launched. This is actually run with a WASM runner. It's not run directly off the .NET runtime. And what's important to note about this is that because it's standalone, it can be bundled up and run anywhere that WASM supported. This is a actual Razor page. There's also a minimal API that I have a plugin that allows me to navigate the, the JSON results for. So this is ASP.NET Core running entirely on WebAssembly. Yeah, so that's a that's a uh, a look of a few cool things. And I, you know, my uh, my ask to everybody is go out there and grab .NET six today. It's got awesome performance. It's got the new simplicity that we started started with, and we're going to continue into .NET seven. And you know, it runs everywhere on all 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 the things. Um, I would also ask people to try .NET 7. Uh, so the latest preview has a lot of this uh, usability features that I, I, I talked about earlier built into it, um, and it'll be shipping in November uh, at this, .net, the, this, 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 this fall's .NET Conf. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person. Um, I will be next year if uh, you folks will have me. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always reach me uh, on Twitter at, at Cool CSH. Thank you so much.